Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? Well, I'm up very early this morning. I've actually been up for a little while. Oh, excuse me. Can't go back to sleep. And I'm kind of bleary-eyed, so I may stumble over the words a little bit because everything's still a little blurry. But we'll get through this. This morning, we're going to be reading out of Deuteronomy 32, 9, the Lord's portion is his people. The Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. How interesting that all the way back in the Old Testament, knowing what we know about what's going to happen in the future, you know, we've read the prophets, we've read the book of Revelation, and the remnant is coming out of Jacob. The, the one-third of the Jews that are going to be saved are coming out of Jacob. And he says here, Jacob is the place of his inheritance. So even in the Old Testament, at the very beginning, he was already giving hints as to what was going to happen. So when you understand the end, you now really start to understand the beginning. Let's read this in context here. One, two, three, four, five. Verse four, he is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of truth and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. They have corrupted themselves. They are not his children because of their blemish. A persevere, or sorry, a perverse and crooked generation. Do you thus deal with the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father who brought, who bought you? Has he not made you and established you? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you your elders, and they will tell you. When the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the wasteland, a howling wilderness. He encircled him, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye, as an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings. So the Lord alone led him, and there was no foreign God with him. He made him ride in the heights of the earth, that he might eat the produce of the fields. He made him draw honey from the rock and oil from the flinty rock herds from the cattle and milk from the flock, with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan and goats, the choicest wheat, and you drank wine, the blood of the grapes. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, you grew thick, you are obese. Then he forsook God who made him and scornfully esteemed the rock of his salvation. And this has been the lot for the Israeli people throughout their history. But God has always kept a remnant. <coughs> Interesting that the, the church, since its beginning, has done much of the same thing. But there's always been a remnant. There's a pattern here. There's a pattern here that I don't think a lot of people catch. There's a pattern here that a lot of, I don't think we realize what God is doing. He gathers all the people in under the umbrella and then sorts through who is supposed to be there and who isn't. We're moving the remnant because when everybody comes under the umbrella, there's not enough room. But when you start to weed out those who are supposed to be there and those who aren't, then there's plenty of room. So we see these parallels. We see what happened to Israel throughout history. We have it recorded in the Bible. Why would we be any different? Because they are, are our example. And it would, we would do well to pay attention to what happened to them so that we don't tread that same path. What has happened? Well, for the most part, the church has. Now, the Lord is doing something interesting here in that he's taking people from the Jewish nation, taking those from the Gentile nations, bringing them together and making one entity, the church. This is going to be set aside for Jesus. But then there's a remnant in Israel, 
that is a separate remnant for God. You go back to the book of Ruth, you see this being explained. The, the, the patriarch, I have my inheritance. You take these. Talking to uh, Boaz, Boaz being the representation of Jesus. So Jesus took the remnant of the church. God takes the remnant of Israel. And both will end up existing. Because the Lord always has his portion. He always has his part. And in the end, we will all end up being together. It's very complicated sometimes to try to understand it this way, but it's also very easy. We read the book, we understand the concept. I just, it would have been better, I think, if the church would have stopped and sat down and had discussions about, look at what's happened. We don't need to tread that path. Let us not go that way. But, as is the way with all things, at some point, the majority of it's going to get messed up. It is what it is. There's always just a small, tiny group. How are they his? By his own sovereign choice. He chose them and set his love upon them. Then he did all together apart from any goodness in them at the time or any goodness which he foresaw in them. He had mercy on whom he would have mercy and ordained a chosen company unto eternal life. Thus, therefore, are they his by his unconstrained election. They are not only his by choice, but by purchase. He has bought and paid for them to the utmost farthing. Hence, about his title, there can be no dispute. Not with corruptible things, as with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord's portion has been fully redeemed. There is no mortgage on his estate. No suits can be raised by opposing claimants. The price was paid in open court, and the church is the Lord's freehold forever. See the blood mark upon all the chosen, invisible to human eye, but known to Christ, for the Lord knoweth them that are his. He forgetteth none of those whom he has redeemed from among men. He counts the sheep for whom he laid down his life, and remembers well the church for which he gave himself. They are also his by conquest. What a battle he had in us before we would have be won. How long he laid siege to our hearts. How often he sent us terms of capitulation. But we barred our gates and fenced our walls against him. Do we not remember that glorious hour when he carried our hearts by storm? When he placed his cross against the wall and scaled our ramparts, planting on our strongholds the blood-red flag of his omnipotent mercy? Yes, we are indeed the conquered captives of his omnipotent love. Thus chosen, purchased, and subdued, the rights of our design, divine possessor are inalienable. We rejoice that we never can be our own, and we desire day by day to do his will and to show forth his glory. So the devotional also paints the same picture of the example God set with Israel and how that mirrors what happened with the church. God still has his people, Israel. The remnant will be saved. But Jesus did something incredible in that he took Jew and Gentile and brought them together and made something completely different. Something brand new. And so in an incredible way, full redemption has come for those whom God chooses. For those whom God has redeemed. For them, those whom Jesus has paid the debt. Now, Jesus has paid the debt for everybody. Not everybody will be saved. Not everybody will receive it. Some people won't be saved. They don't want to. They lack understanding and foresight. And their hearts are dark. Just like in Israel. 
How many generations did he destroy because they would not receive him, because their hearts were dark? It was a purging, and it's been an ongoing purging. And there will be a future one that will finish, finish it off and expose the core, the perfect core, the remnant. Same with the church. We're having a purging right now. Look how many people are fleeing the church. Not fleeing the faith as in they're running away from it. They're fleeing into, into falsehood, into deception. They still count themselves as Christians, and yet they are not. Because they want their way. They want their truth, not the truth. <sighs> Notice the difference between the and their is an I and an R. Because they all want to be God. I are God. Instead of him being God. Same thing has happened with Israel. They are our example. They decided they wanted to be God or they wanted other gods. The church is doing the same thing. So we see the two parallels here. But God has laid his love out for all. The problem is God. The problem is not all of us will receive it. Jesus Christ has laid out salvation for all. The problem isn't Jesus. The problem is people don't want that salvation. But they are happy to stand right at the door take the title and enjoy all the benefits without any of the repercussions, without any of the requirements, without any of the instructions, without any of the commands. The Lord's portion is his people. For God, it's Israel's remnant. For Jesus, it's the bride, the church. And they're remnant. And in the end, because they are together and they are one, we will be one too. How amazing. How incredible. How astonishing to witness how God is doing this. The most complicated process. Taking millennia to complete. And done perfectly. And it will ultimately become a perfect work. When everything is said and done. Our God is perfect. Our God is so omnipotent. Our God is, is outside of our understanding to the point that we couldn't even fathom how he could put something together the way he does. The amount of intricacies associated with it are amazing. It boggles the mind. Because we try to sit and keep track of it and it's impossible. We can't even get it. We get to the point where our brain just stops. <laughs> we can't even think about it anymore. But look at how he is doing it. Because he has chased those generations down the line of the ones that would be saved in the end. He established them in the beginning and they're there at the end. Look at the line of Jesus. Look how long that line covers. And all the people that are in it. Ending at him. Him being the final. The first and the last. He was first because he was first. He's last because he finished it. He ended it all. He sealed the contract. This perfect work that God is doing is still astounding to me because of its, its intricacy. It goes beyond human understanding in every way. But there are many who would say, oh, well, I think this is what God's doing. Well, why don't you read his word and find out what he's doing? Because he tells us. And it is glorious. Because he seeks those who the world doesn't want anymore. He seeks those to give his love to that will receive it. And by his grace and mercy, that has become us. By his wonderful grace and mercy, it has become us. We have been called by his grace, sealed and saved by his mercy, redeemed by his love, chosen by his foreknowledge, 
and protected and provided for by his providence. What an amazing God we have to see what he's doing and to have an entire record, not 100% complete per se, but an entire record giving us the details and the examples of what to follow. And even in the New Testament, the apostles even talk about this. This was given as an example. They reference this back all the time. It comes down to the same old problem it always has been. People don't read this book. They pretend to. They look at key verses, but they don't read this book. They don't take the time to look at what it says. That's frightening. Because the greatest level of deception comes from that very thing. <coughs> Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. To give you praise, honor, and glory. To lift you up and to sing praises unto your holy name. Father, save your people. Save your people, Israel. Your book tells us there is a remnant. You already know who that is. You already have them positioned, and they are going to come out of Judah. We know this perfectly. We know this specifically because you gave us the details behind it. We have a record of, the, of an example of what not to do and what to do concerning you. And we have a whole history of a, of a peoples that tells us this, that shows us this. How interesting the church follows very much a similar suit, maybe even to a worse degree in some cases. But you have a remnant saved out of her too. Why would we not listen to the example that is given? When we do this in daily things, we watch cooking shows and follow their example. We read instructions for the electronics in our houses. Well, some people do. And follow those examples. Why would we not listen to your book and read your book that gives us life examples? And it all comes down to the same thing. Pride. It's the pride of the people that is the killer. It's ignorance, willful ignorance of the truth, even though the truth is right in front of them. And Lord, you have gone th through great lengths to show the truth to everybody right there so that no one will have an excuse. And no one does. But what would be the purpose of having a book that records it all if we don't listen to the book? We're happy to take stuff for granted and as truths written by Plato and Socrates, yet the earliest writings we have are 1,500 years after their deaths. We, we, we want that, that we, we deem legitimate. But this book proves to the very lifetime of the writers of it, with more than enough proof to show that it's legitimate. Why don't people accept that? It's because they don't want you. They don't want to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. From my perspective, Father, and, and I don't know if this is the case, to me it's too easy. Not that that's a negative. I think that's a wonderful positive. It's easy on purpose. It's easy for a reason. You made it that way on purpose. But I think for most people, the easiest thing in the world for them to do is also the hardest thing in the world for them to do. Just like the Jews, literally, you, they saw you, they witnessed you, they saw your majesty and your power. They were, partook in the wonderful blessings you poured out on them, choosing them as someone specific. And what did they do? They had it so good. They had it so easy. And what did they do? The opposite of what they should have done. We are no different. We have the whole recording of it to go back and look at as an example. We have the warnings throughout your book telling us, Here's what I'm doing. Watch out for these things. And yet we do exactly the opposite. Just like disobedient children. It's no wonder you must chastise us. And you must rebuke us. And you must correct us. Well, Father, I would much rather take your correction. Because I know from your word that that correction is in love. Because you care about us and want us to know the truth. And to walk in that truth. Just like you have done with your people. Well, now there's a day coming to deal with that. For this last 2,000 years, you've been dealing with the church in much the same way. Not in exactly the way it was then, but 
much the same way now. But this age of grace has been very interesting because you have allowed a whole lot of things that you didn't allow in the past. And we know that is because there is a day of judgment coming when all things will be taken care of. All things will be dealt with. Full justice will come. So Lord, I say again, save your people. Save your people, Israel. Save your people, the church. We know there's a remnant in each. We see an example given. And the church has not followed that example for the most part. But my prayer is that all eyes will be opened when the time is right. All truth will be revealed. Nothing will be hidden. Your word says that that's the case. But that those who have turned a blind eye, even though they carry the title, will see things as they are and will come to terms with it and turn around and walk back to you. Instead of walking away and being disobedient, they will humble themselves and do what they were supposed to do. Follow what they were told to follow. And obey your word perfectly. To follow your lead. To pay attention to the example. I think the most horrible thing we could do is to take away the reminders. Because when we take away the reminders of the past, we are doomed to repeat it because we don't remember it. People seek to make this book not exist anymore. Well, we need these references. We need these reminders of how Israel responded to you. Because our the church is doing very, very similar things. And it's disturbing. But you said it's going to happen that way. There will be a great falling away, just like there was a falling away in Israel. But just like there's a remnant in Israel, there's one in the church too. We see these parallels. We see these examples being given. And Father, I thank you for those. I thank you for this word, for this devotion to point these things out, to get us to pay more attention to what's going on. Show us your mercy and your grace, Lord. That we are so slow as not to catch these things, not to pay attention to these things, not to do these things. But to repeat the same mistakes over and over again. I think this is something that is doomed for mankind to do. We just, we just cannot get out of our own way. But there is a remedy. Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, you came to move all the roadblocks out of the way and go, here you go. Here's a focal point. Everybody can enter in. If you so choose. You've given us all the ability to do so. You've given us all the, the things that we need to see and make the decision. What has happened? For the most part, the Jewish people have rejected you. A remnant is left. For the most part, the church has rejected you. Even though they're in that church every Sunday, even though they're doing all their, their things that they think we're supposed to do, literally making it look like they're God's people when in their hearts they're not, just like the Jews, having their gods, their other gods, yet saying they worship you just like the Jews did. I mean, we're literally following the pattern. But in the church there is a remnant too. You have kept a remnant out of both. And when the remnant of the church is taken, then it's time to reveal the remnant of Israel. And she will be taken too. And we will stand in your presence. Just like your word says. We will see each other as we are. We will know who each other's who we who we are. And we will see you. So the glorious surprise ending is that those that truly are yours will be revealed and will be separated from the rest who adamantly deny you even while standing in your house of worship the jews did it we do it they were running a meat market out of the back of the temple most churches today are tax shelters
May your will be done in this as in all things. May your people, Israel, be revealed. The ones who want you, the ones who are true. May the church, the true bride, stand up out of the rest. And be revealed for who she is. It is to your glory, and we pray for your glory to be shown. Thank you for your blessings, your, your mercy, your great love, your grace that you shower us with. Thank you for this gift of salvation you have offered to Jew and Gentile alike. It is astounding and amazing to witness this superior gift. And all it requires is belief. You take the reins from there and lead us into perfection. How can we ignore something so precious, so amazing, so perfect? And yet, for the most part, people do. Well, Lord, may, may we not be of that sort. You've called us here for a reason. You've brought us here for a reason. You've shown us these examples for a reason. You've gone through the effort of preparing this book over the course of human history for a reason. May we listen to it and follow its example. Avoiding what not to do and going all in on what we should be doing according to your will and for your glorification i pray for both remnants that your mercy be showered upon them your grace abound in them your love be shed abroad in all their hearts and your wonderful salvation deliver all of us Because the glorious end of all this is a new heavens, a new earth, and a new people. A new people where sin doesn't exist anymore. Where temptation doesn't affect anymore. What a glorious time. What a glorious day. What a glorious eternity it's going to be. When you finish your perfect work. And we look forward to that. So thank you, Father, for your mercy and grace and your great love, your free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for morning devotion. A great example has been given to us. A great story has been told to us, showing the plight of a people that were chosen by God. And the lesser number did the right thing. The greater number did the opposite. To the point even there were onesies and twosies that were doing the right thing. And the entire rest of the nation was corrupted. But God never left them without truth. He never left them without light. So people who God chose returned to that light. Fast forward to 2,000 years ago, the church was born. Same scenario has been happening this whole time. Same scenario has unfolded. The Jews had about 2,000 years. We've had about 2,000 years. It's all going to culminate in a final time of redemption. A final time of judgment. A thousand years of the final purging. Revealing the true intents of the heart and the true decisions that are going to be made by the people. To know who really is for God and who isn't. Out of the church and out of Israel. What a wondrous time it's going to be to see the things we're going to see. You can't even imagine what the millennial reign is going to be like. Only what the Bible has told us. But we're going to get to see the Jewish people, that holy remnant, become the people they were meant to be in that thousand years. And we will be revealed for who we really are just before that and we'll walk with them in that thousand years the stories we're going to tell the things we're going to learn about the past and about the future and the examples we're going to be able to compare between the church and the Jews Jews and the church and we're going to get to see the revealing of the wonderful future of 
all people coming together under one banner, the banner of Jesus Christ. Amazing. We have that to look forward to. And so much more that we have not yet seen, that has not yet been revealed. We can't even comprehend what is waiting in the future for the Jewish remnant and for us. But we know, according to Scripture, it is going to be great, and the glory of God will shine forth forever. The rule of Jesus Christ will shine forth forever. Incredible. Incredible that we get to play a part in this, that we are going to get to see this. That's astounding. That there's something on the horizon that the rest of the world doesn't even know exists, and we know, and we are going to get to see it in vivid color, with new eyes that are, will get to see everything. Amazing. I'm looking forward to that. And it's exciting. Because when you start to tell people about that, it blows right past them. They can't even comprehend it because the Lord hasn't revealed it to them that they can't receive it. But he has given it to us. This wonderful gift. Let us not squander it. Let us not waste it. Instead, let us build on it. Take the example of the past and look forward to a greater future. Walking the path laid before us in Christ, in faith. Amen. Love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name and I'll see you in the next video.